Welcome back to the 2022 Apex Tech Summit. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, U.S. Representative Kai Kahele. Congressman Kahele is serving his first term in Congress, and he represents Hawaii's second congressional district. He also serves on two House committees, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and the Armed Services Committee. Congressman Kahele is a combat veteran, pilot, and a commissioned officer in the Hawaii Air National Guard U.S. Air Force, where he continues to serve as a lieutenant colonel at Hickam Air Force Base. He served in Iraq and Afghanistan in support of Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom. Please welcome Congressman Kahele. Aloha kako. This is Congressman Kai Kahele representing Hawaii's 2nd Congressional District, and I'm thrilled to join all of you for the 2022 Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies Tech Summit. I would like to begin by giving thanks to APAC's President and CEO, Madeline Milka, her entire team, and everyone who has contributed in helping this event come to fruition. Technology, as we have all seen in the past couple of years, has given us the wonderful ability to interact with one another, reach across hundreds and thousands of miles, to coordinate and collaborate regardless of differing time zones, and has created international communities and connections to last lifetimes. It helps us stay in touch with family members and good friends, and has educated us about things that we could only otherwise dream of learning about, all at the touch of our fingertips. In regards to social and political change, Technology is unprecedented with its ability to unite people of all backgrounds, garner support for common causes, and inspire individuals to become more involved with their government at both the local and federal levels. However, with the emergence of ever-developing and intertwined technological world, we are also put at risk to online disinformation. Inaccurate and harmful content has the capacity to create a barrier between communities and polarized social and political spectrums. As a result, issue areas like the COVID-19 pandemic, election security, and environmental change are all vulnerable to the ravages of misinformation. The misuse of social media and technology indicates to us that companies like Facebook and Twitter must be held accountable to regulate the harmful effects that they have created by misleading information that separates and divides our country especially narratives that perpetuate violence aimed at the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community. This is why conversations about technology and social media must take place within our schools, institutions, and in forums like this panel. When used correctly and responsibly, we can use technology to inspire us to be stronger, to stand alongside one another, and to empower us with the resources to protect the Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. Mahalo nui loa for having me here today. It is great honor to work alongside leaders at the AA NHPI level and to continue the incredible work and conversation with APAX. Mahalo. Thank you for your remarks, Cong Congressman Kahale. Our next panel today is how technology affects social change. In this session, experts will explore the effects of technology on society and how it can be used to raise awareness and foster tangible change. Our moderator for this discussion is Sonal Shaw, who is currently serving as Interim Executive Vice President, Worldwide Network Advancement for United Way Worldwide. Ms. Shaw is a global leader on social impact and innovation. She has started and led social impact efforts in academia, government, and the private and philanthropy sectors for more than 25 years. Most recently, she founded and led the Asian American Foundation, raising over $1 billion, the largest philanthropic effort serving the Asian American community. Ms. Shaw was appointed by President Biden to serve as the Chief Commissioner on the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. She also serves on the Homeland Security Advisory Council. Please welcome Sonal. Well, thank you, Madeline, and thank you, Apex, for all of the great work that you continue to do. And really, this is such an important topic that you've taken on uh, at the Tech Summit on how technology affects social change. Uh, as we all know, it has both pros and cons, and this panel will be discussing both the pros and cons of it and looking forward to uh, hearing our, our great panel talk through this. Let me introduce each of our panelists, and then uh, we'll get started. Again, Good and bad, we wanna be able to talk about it all. So I'm gonna start with our first uh, question on how have you seen technology contribute to social change 
in your areas of expertise and the work you do. Um, Jenny, I'm going to start with you uh, with, you know, what you're doing at Asian Amer- AAJC, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, um, and, and tell us how you're using it and how you're seeing technology contribute to social change in your area. Sure. Um, Thanks, Sonal. And yeah, I just wanted to start out by thanking Tanya and the rest of the APAX team for pulling this summit together. We're really, I'm really interested to hear from the other panelists and just have a good conversation about a really important topic. So yeah, in terms of how technology contributes to the work that I do and misinformation, the answer is kind of complex, right? So technology has really uniquely shaped how our communities have consumed information and communicated with another in recent history um, and that it's done a really good job of connecting our communities and especially making it easier to communicate with people living in other parts of the world, but it's also created challenges. So one example of that is the app WeChat, right? So uh, for those unfamiliar, it's a messaging app commonly used by members of the Chinese American diaspora to communicate with people um, living back in China and also used in China itself. So I like to think of it as almost Venmo, Facebook, and iMessage all rolled into one. You can use it to pay people, to um, post pictures, to talk to one another. And it's really changed how uh, members of the community communicate with one another. Just thinking about how when I was a kid um, communicating and calling my grandparents back home, right, you'd have to call a number on the back of a plastic card and listen to a robotic message, tell you how many minutes you had left, and then go through and call the number and think about how many minutes you have and try to keep your conversation short because it was expensive uh, with something like WeChat and an app like that, where you can just through the click of a button, call someone, it's really revolutionized how communication happens, right? But the converse of that is it's also created lots of challenges, especially with mis- and disinformation, because unfortunately, the app is designed in a way that really makes it a perfect vector for falsehoods and mis- and disinformation to thrive. And I'm sure um, Cynthia will talk more to that during her remarks. Um, But yeah, so ultimately, mis- and disinformation and media manipulation is something that's been around for centuries, but the advent of technology and platforms and technologies have just changed the scale of the problem. And in a lot of senses, information overload makes it harder for people to discern fact from fiction. And then converse to that, information vacuums also create openings for falsehoods to thrive as well. Um, We've also seen how falsehoods can be personalized and then amplified, as in the case with um, instances of election manipulation. We saw that in 2016 and 2020, and we'll unfortunately also see it again with this election cycle. So we often like to think of technology not as the root cause of this problem, right, because it's been around for a very long time, but it serves almost as an accelerant of sorts and is just really fanning the flames of something that's already kind of, that's been festering for a long time. And Jenny, can I just follow up here for a second, which is how has that changed sort of what you all have had to do at AAJC with all of the, with how technology is being used? How, how, have, you, how have y'all been dealing with it at, uh, at AAJC? Yeah, so we've focused, uh, we focused a good portion of our mis- and disinformation work on working with platforms to change how this how mis- and disinformation is spread and working to push for things like algorithmic changes and more language um, transparency and parity with how, regu- for example, how regulations are enforced, right? We've often seen how on a platform like Facebook, for example, um, mis- and disinformation is allowed to spread more readily in languages other than English, just given how the content moderation mechanisms work. So ultimately, we've obviously with something like missing disinformation, it's a very technology focused issue, right? So a lot of our work designed to combat it harkens back to working with the platforms and working with um, t- working to tackle kind of the end a- aspect of it, which is the technology, but while ultimately also working on tackling the root cause, which is, of course, more more community-centered and more focused on 
um, working on things like media literacy and civic engagement and focusing more on the people and ultimately those who are consuming the information itself. So we like to not think of it as only 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 focusing on technology based solutions in isolation, but working with working to use them as part of a larger, larger community based interventions. Fantastic. Thank you, Eileen. This is not new to ADL, misinformation, disinformation, uh, technology, everything I think Jenny has said uh, very much applies to a lot of the work you all have been doing at ADL. We'd love to hear from you all how, how it has affected um, your work and, and, and how you approach it. Sure. First, thank you so much, Apex and um, Sonal, for inviting me here. And um, I'm looking so, so much to forward to this conversation. So just very briefly by way of introduction, the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, uh, was uh, was started in 1913 in an era of rising racism and anti-Semitism, and its mission is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to seek justice and fair treatment to all. Um, democracy initiatives, which I oversee, our work on that is new this year at ADL. And the reason why, and uh, I'll just uh, as I say a couple words about that and then go into how it uh, intersects with what we're talking about with technology. But the reason why we took on this new focus is that the threat to democracy now is greater than uh, most experts across the world in the United States agree is greater than at any time since the beginning of the Civil War. And the threat of political violence is really high. And the biggest predictor of political violence is not what you might think here, such as income inequality or many other things, but it's actually whether there's ethno-nationalist divides, divides based on identity, based on religion, ethnicity, and religion. Uh, and race, uh, for example. So there are many, many reasons why we're at a, a crossroads in terms of the threat to democracy. Some have been going on for decades, some are more recent. Obviously, they include, you know, uh, money in politics and, and the rollback, the huge rollback in civil rights that we're seeing across the United States, hyperpartisanship, income inequality, um, no more local news, de uh, demise of unions. There are many, many things, but there are three things that are particularly in ADL's area of expertise. And that's where we focus and try to leverage our experience and assets. And one is the mainstreaming and normalizing of extremism, uh, where once fringe ideologies and movements, such as white supremacy and anti-government and sovereign citizen organizations, uh, those ideologies and their adherents are becoming mainstreamed, normalized, and localized. Second is the surge in anti-Semitism and other identity-based hate. In 2021, there were more anti-Semitic incidents, by which we mean assault, harassment, or vandalism, than at any other time since ADL started uh, uh, keeping track in 1979. And as I'll mention in a, uh, in a moment, the biggest and sharpest increase in hate online targeted the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. So there's that surge in anti-Semitism, the mainstream of extremism. And the third thing is what we're talking about here also, which is the spread of online hate, unprecedented viral channels that, as Jenny said, really act as, uh, as accelerants. And this is something relatively new. Um, and and uh, we're also poised at a, a point where the new, you know, this is not just Facebook with the, the meta, but the metaverse, a new era of artificial intelligence uh, and of um, virtual reality um, and uh, deep fakes. So this is a pivotal moment if we're going to intervene in many different ways, legislative, regulatory, litigation, education, um, market campaigns uh, directly engaged at the tech companies. Uh, this is this is a really important time, and as Jenny said, this is this is a multifaceted campaign. It has to, a lot of it has to be community based. If we leave this to professionals, if, if this is professionalized in different ways, we will not be successful. So we have to mobilize our communities, as Jenny said. I'm, I hope to have a chance a little bit later on to talk about some of the good things uh, and how we use tech and this stuff. But I'm going to, if you'll bear with me, just say a few things that are on the sobering side, because I want to give some figures from ADL's recent online hate and harassment survey. This is a, um, a nationally representative survey that we conduct every year. 
and it looks at hate-based harassment, uh, which has held steady for some years, um, marginal, uh, marginalized groups, identity groups, uh, 65% of, of folks who identify as a marginalized or vulnerable group, uh, one or more, uh, say that they have been subjected to online hate and harassment. Asian Americans reported a dramatic increase in harassment from 21% of them saying they had experienced in 2021 to 39% uh, this year. And that parallels the rise in anti-Asian hate hate incidents offline. And this increase also follows a spike in the previous year of severe harassment, by which I mean physical threats, sustained harassment, stalking, sexual harassment, doxing or swatting targeting Asian Americans. 17% of our nationally representative uh, sampling uh, of Asian Americans said they had experienced that kind of severe online harassment in 2021, uh, uh, 17% in 2021, up from 11% in 2020. So in 2022, Asian Americans were also more likely than non-Asian Americans to report experiencing sustained harassment. So the group that's particularly the focus of APEX is the group that is having the steepest rise in targeting online based on our surveys. Eileen, thank you. And that is very sobering. I think having those statistics and having that data is, um, it's, it's much more a human perspective to this also, like what are communities feeling every day and, and how they're feeling it and, and experiencing it. So thank you for that. I want to shift a little bit. Like I, I, I think both Eileen and Jenny have given us such a sobering perspective of um, what technology can do uh, if, if not used well. But at the same time, there are many things that technology has also opened up. It's opened up our ability to hear stories more effectively. It's a, it's opened up our ability to um, find places we might want to live in a different way. So I think it's it's sort of also opened up an, an opportunity. And so I'm, I'm I want to ask our 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 two other guests, Nayana and Greg, a little bit about sort of how has technology also been leveraged for social good? What are you seeing? And I know, Eileen, you referenced to this in in the work that you're doing, but I I think I also would like to hear from our our two colleagues. Um, Nayana, can I start with you? Uh, Tell us a little bit about how Airbnb has leveraged technology and what it has meant for the community and from a social impact perspective. Thanks, Anu, and thanks to APAC team for having us here. Uh, Before I dive in, let me share a brief intro to Airbnb. We are a global platform helping travelers connect with hosts who offer unique stays and experiences. So today there are over 4 million hosts on the platform who have welcomed more than 1 billion guest arrivals in almost every country across the globe. So by the very nature of the platform, we have seen Airbnb playing a key role in helping build connection between strangers across all kinds of man-made boundaries, be it nationalities, languages, gender, or race and class. But at the same time, when you bring people who are not familiar with each other together, there are also some challenges that comes along with it. So as a platform, we have um, seen instances of discrimination faced by guests based on their race or other features. And there has been a very strong response from Airbnb as well in terms of a community commitment that requires that every user of the platform should um, you know agree to respect and treat everyone equally, regardless of any of their other you know background or features. There has been a lot of collaboration with nonprofit organizations and a whole range of stakeholders to address some of the challenges that Eileen has mentioned, Jenny has mentioned, uh, that comes from platforms bringing people together. But for today, I would like to focus on, like you said, Sonal two areas where uh, we have seen Airbnb as a platform being leveraged as a tool tool for social good by our host and guest. So the first thing, and where we have also then as a platform, we have seen the results from that. We have invested deliberately to support those efforts as well. And the first of them is in the area of response to natural and man-made disasters. As we all know, shelter is a basic human need that is often impacted first when it comes to unexpected natural disasters and other humanitarian crises. And since 2012, Airbnb and later Airbnb.org, which is our 501c3 nonprofit launched in 2017, we have been working to provide free temporary stays to people in times of need. And like we all know, that need has recently been amplified by two global crises. 
when the Taliban took over Afghanistan in 2021, it brought over 76,000 Afghan refugees to the U.S. Temporary housing has been critical to ease their transition out of military bases and into new communities. And earlier this year, Russia's invasion of Ukraine created a massive humanitarian crisis, which brought, I believe, more than 7 million Ukraine refugees across the border. So in response, Airbnb.org committed to provide free temporary housing for 20,000 Afghan refugees and up to 100,000 refugees fleeing Ukraine. I am very proud to say that so far, Airbnb.org has helped provide stays to more than 26,000 Afghan refugees and already hit the goal of um, providing housing for almost 100,000 refugees fleeing Ukraine. So this is one area where we have seen that you know, it's our host and guest coming together and making this whole magic happen. Uh, it's the host on Airbnb and Airbnb.org who are offering their homes for free for people to stay in times of need. The second one that I would like to highlight is where we have been able to support local communities benefit from tourism through Airbnb academies. The idea of academies came uh, when many of us, including me, when I was working in India, realizing that there was a massive underserved community in many of the countries that we operated. They might never benefit from tourism unless uh, platforms such as ours made deliberate efforts to include them. So what we did with the Academy is that we partner with leading nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and other stakeholders locally, and make sure that we are creating deliberate training programs to ensure that um, you know, users or hosts from underserved communities are able to get onto the platform, they are able to succeed on the platform. Just to give an example, uh, in India, we partnered with the Self-Employed Women's Association, which is a trade union of over 2 million rural women. And now they are being trained, they are host on the platform, they are you know, welcoming travelers from around the world. And there are similar efforts being made in the US, in South Africa, in Kenya, where there are entrepreneurs being trained, they are becoming part of the platform. When, uh, you know, in a normal course, without that kind of an effort, they may not be the ones who will be considered savvy enough to succeed on a platform such as Airbnb. So I would I would stop here just to highlight the fact that, um, you know, technology has a role as a tool for social good. There are ways in which we can co-create a lot of opportunities for communities that are most, um, sometimes most disadvantaged by technology itself. Thank you. Thank you, Nayana. That's super helpful. And I think a, a, a good example of sort of understanding how you're leveraging your technology uh, to do that. And also, I think we'll go a little bit more into this too, how, how to manage the, the downsides of it and what are what are ways to do that. So thank you for opening with that. And thank you for the thank you for the, the great examples that sort of highlight. Uh, Greg, I'm going to turn to you. I think, uh, you know, Everyone knows the Motion Picture Association. Uh, I think we've all we've all been a recipient and have been a part of, but really would love to understand how you all are using technology to um, to sort of for social good and to help communities around the world. Yeah, thanks, Sonal, and uh, thank you again to APAX. I uh, join my my fellow panelists and and expressing my gratitude for being, having the opportunity to speak on this panel and. Um, you, you know, for those of you who don't know the Motion Picture Association, uh, we represent the six largest media companies, including uh, Walt Disney, NBC Universal, Sony Pictures Entertainment, Netflix, Warner Brothers Discovery, and, and Paramount Global. And, um, you know, as you kind of insinuated in, in your lead in, um, you know, we're in a period of just in incredible technological innovation and change in the film and television industry. And that's both in the way that uh, consumers generally uh, interact with films and shows, but also in helping to create a lot of really exciting new opportunities for fresh, diverse voices to tell their stories and to find their audiences, leveraging um, all sorts of, of, of new and, and innovative technologies. And the most um, obvious manifestation of that trend, of course, is the uh, accelerating kind of transformation uh, towards streaming services. But you know, while a lot of conversations and media attention tend to focus on you know distribution and 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 how consumers are are accessing uh, films and shows, you know, digital technologies have also really lowered barriers to entry for uh, aspiring filmmakers and storytellers who have just incredibly powerful new tools to learn from, experiment with um, on the production side, and then of course when you couple that with 
uh, technologies like social media that provide pathways for creators to, to connect directly with their fans uh, and their audiences. Um, you really get a lot of exciting potential for aspiring storytellers from all walks of life um, to, to, to enter an industry which, you know, is, is difficult to break into uh, uh, under the best uh, of circumstances. And then, of course, too, um, you know, those same technologies are used by the companies that we represent uh, uh, to reach out um, uh, to all sorts of audiences that they may not have been able to access before in order to supplement marketing campaigns and whatnot. And MPA's own uh, economic research really underscores the importance of diverse audiences to the financial health of any particular film or show. And so it's a kind of an uh, uh, important ability of theirs uh, uh, to create excitement and awareness uh, uh, about a film or a show that's coming out. And so, you know, all, all of that is super exciting uh, and happening under the rubric of this incredible, you know, technological innovation. But, it, you know, even taking a, a step back from that, there are all sorts of efforts being made um, to advance social change in the film and television industry. And just to kind of give you a, a sense of what that looks like, it, it takes three forms. Uh, uh, the first is diversifying the creative pipeline. Uh, and what I mean by that is creating more opportunities for uh, creators from traditionally underrepresented communities uh, uh, to tell their, tell their stories and to find their audiences. And the companies that MPA represents are, are fully committed to this goal through a host of partnerships with uh, multicultural organizations that are committed to, to fostering and uplifting uh, diverse creators. And just to give you a sense of what that looks like, here at MPA, you know, we work with the Center for uh, Asian American Media. We work with the DC Asian Pacific American Film Festival, the latter of which my colleague uh, Peter Zhang will soon be joining the board of, as well as organizations, of course, like APAX um, and others focused on representing the AAPI community here in Washington and around the country. And all told, we partner with um, over 50 organizations that are focused on uh, those goals. And of course, the companies we represent all have uh, robust policies and in-house programs as well to diversify their workforces and create more opportunities both in front of and behind the camera. Uh, and also to tell more culturally authentic stories, which I'll get to in a second. Um, I would just say there's you know, too many of these policies and programs probably to go into uh, uh, detail here, but I would encourage you to visit MPA's Advancing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion page on our website. Details everything that we're doing here at the Motion Picture Association, as well as including links out to um, a number of companies' uh, inclusion sites where you can really kind of dig in uh, to what they're doing and get a better sense of, of the policies and programs that they have in place. You know, the, the second kind of prong of um, what we're doing to advance social change, as I mentioned, is around uh, culturally authentic storytelling, which is a real major focus uh, amongst the studios. And you've likely seen what this looks like uh, in recent years through films like Crazy Rich Asians and Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings, Easter Sunday, which is in theaters now, go see it, um, as well as on the TV side, shows like Partner Track and Never Have I Ever. And you know, the studios go to great lengths to get this right, not only by, you know, giving diverse writers and directors opportunities, but also through things like hiring culturally specific consultants um, to get, you know, granular details and nuances, right? Things like language, customs, wardrobes, um, a lot of time, attention and resources is paid to these details um, um, in order to really try and um, represent uh, different cultures authentically on the big screen. And these efforts also um, extend beyond production. As I was saying earlier, marketing is a big part of this. And uh, again, they go to great lengths to ensure that they're reaching the audiences that they think will um, um, you know, benefit from these stories and really find them uh, exciting. So the last thing I'll mention that we're doing, um, I just kind of put in the category of, of broader industry initiatives. And the reason I say that um, is because the film and television industry really is much bigger than just the studios. It's a much larger family comprised of unions and guilds and talent agencies and awards organizations and many more, all of whom have a role uh, to play. And so just to give you, you know, one example of, of something outside of the studios, the MPA, an initiative that's underway, the uh, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which hosts, hosts the Oscars, of course, um, recently adopted uh, new requirements around diversity in order to be eligible for awards. And while 
that may sound frivolous. It's not um, in the sense that um, Oscar nominations can be and wins can be incredibly important to the financial viability uh, of films. So that really serves as a powerful incentive um, um, uh, uh, to do better on these issues uh, uh, within the industry. So, you know, it's just kind of a broad overview of, you know, some of the things happening in the industry to advance social change. And of course, this is all happening under the rubric of, of an incredible kind of digital transformation and disruption and all of the um, um, opportunities that creates. And then, you know, there are some challenges as well um, um, that come with it, which we can get into later, uh, if it makes sense. So thank you. Greg and Nayana, thank you so much uh, for this. It's important that technology has um, an ability to do good, but we also have to manage you know, the downsides and both of your organizations are doing that and super interesting how you're approaching it. But as we know, and as both of them have referenced, uh, the challenges and opportunities exist for communities and how they want to organize themselves to amplify their message using technology effectively and the resources available to them. So uh, I would love, uh, Eileen, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit of your thought of how does, how does ADL approach both the challenges and the opportunities for communities in leveraging technology to amplify messages and use the tools and resources effectively. Thanks, Sona. You know, I, I, I come from a, a top five website where I was inside, so I've seen what can be good and what the challenges are. Before coming to ADL, I was the general counsel for Wikipedia and the head of its public policy, which is, which I think pioneered the best uh, example of, of the good that crowdsourcing in the goal of giving free and accessible knowledge to all the world can do. So I am well aware of the good that can be leveraged uh, from, from technology. As my co-panelists have mentioned, first is the sort of connection. Um, we never were able to connect within our communities and between our communities before the kind of digital tools we had now. So that is fantastic. Uh, and it's something that's so necessary so that we can organize ourselves and, uh, and flex our muscle. Um, I think at ADL, one of the things we're looking at is we, we approach things by advocacy, research, and also engineering tools. So, for example, we have a, a machine learning AI tool that can measure hate as defined by the experts in that type of hate and the communities it affects. Because too often, aside from all the other problems the platforms have, they are not tapping into communities who are the ones who are targeted, who experience, who can best identify and talk about the impact of hate. And that's not included in their engineering work. It's not included in their, their user interface work, in their policy works by and large, or any of their other work. And so it's absolutely crucial that we come together and find each other and seek funding from donors so that we can influence the tech companies themselves, what I call market campaigns, the sort of direct campaigns. And one of the things that's very important there in which we have to use tech tools is to talk to the up and coming um, uh, employees of those communities. A lot of the times those communities are built such as Facebook in a way that their revenues are impervious to a lot of the normal kind of organizing to change things. But what are they scared about? They're scared when the up and coming computer scientists and engineers and other folks that they need say, hey, we don't want to go to a place which more than any other social platform spreads hate and is, is uh, the generator and the source of the hate and harassment online, as ADL surveys have shown when it comes to Facebook. So I think there's that, that there's a, a lot we can do there. I also think that some years ago, folks started talking about privacy by design, that it's not just that you want to have legislation and regulation, but you want to, in the very a way that companies construct their products uh, and services seek to make hate uh, harder. So, for example, causing some friction before things are sent unopened and amplified uh, has been shown empirically to, to cut down on and onto hate. That's really important because remember, with these social media companies, the whole business model is based on their revenues, their profits depend on more engagement. 
And it is unfortunately well known to them and now to, to us on the outside that incitement, inflammatory disinformation and, in, and misinformation promotes engagement more than any other single type of content. So I think that online organizing for legislative, for campaigns, for anti-hate design, and let's not forget the long-term inevitable thing for education. We have to, in a, in a very innovative way, use civic education, digital civics within our communities, within our schools, universities, so that folks can understand the, uh, the problems and the challenges and what's false and what is disinformation. Um, and last I'll say is that one of the things ADL is doing, including with some of the communities represented here, is trying to embed members of those communities in our Center on Extremism, which tracks uh, identity-based hate and extremism online. And we're also working so hard to train our machine learning tools to help identify the kind of hate and harassment online that other communities are expert in. Thank you, Eileen, and thank you, Cynthia. I think uh, important topic, and I think something that I'm sure we're gonna continue to follow. Um, while technology is important, human nature is, is the thing we manage too. So uh, appreciate both of you. Um, I, I wanna um, quickly go, and we only have about 10 minutes left, so I wanna make sure we can get to um, a couple of other questions. But uh, Jenny, I would love to, to talk to you about it. Like, what are some common mistakes you've seen organizations make in applying technology solutions? You implied a little bit in your in your opening comments, and and what are some lessons learned that you all have had? Um, you know, Eileen and Cynthia have given us a little bit, but I'd love to what love to learn from you all. Sure. Yeah. So as I alluded to previously, right, I think misinformation and disinformation is often portrayed as a problem that's created by and therefore solvable by technology. And so I think it's important to remember it's ultimately people who consume and suffer the consequences of these kinds of falsehoods online. So, of course, technology is an important aspect of the solution as well. But this idea of technology as a silver bullet to fix the issues is just kind of um, not very feasible, right? So, for example, just when it comes to mis- and disinformation that affects our communities, we like to think of the issue as threefold. So. The, one of the first issues is language and just access to um, in-language fact-tracked resources is often something that members of our community do not have. And then there's also the issue with technology and how the platforms themselves, as I alluded to previously, are just much worse at flagging mis- and disinformation when it's not in English. And so, of course, that touches on the second prong, which is the platforms themselves, how they're designed algorithms, as we've all touched on previously, as other speakers have touched on throughout this panel. Um, and then the third aspect is just culturally specific nuances, home country biases, and different things, and the ways that different targeted messaging make targeted messaging makes our communities vulnerable as well. So right, platforms and technology is a key focus of this. Um, so for example, the WeChat echo chambers that I alluded to, um, Facebook's algorithm working to push out more sensationalized content that, of course, um, drives more profit, uh, and how a platform like YouTube and the recommendation systems it has can drive people further down um, rabbit holes and conspiracy theories. So I think it's important, of course, we're not trying to downplay the culpability that technology companies have in this issue, but it's important to think about these solutions that are technology focused, not in isolation, right? So of course we are advocating for um, technology platforms to address falsehoods and hate speech on their platforms. And of, of course, specifically working to be better at targeting content that's not in English, but in isolation, these, these strategies will be effective. So no one algorithm or platform change is going to solve the problem of misinformation. It's ultimately the root causes and what's what makes members of our community susceptible to believe the these lies in the first first place that I think is just as important when thinking about the solutions. So we're, we try to stress that in addition to platform accountability and changes and government interventions, the importance of media literacy, as Eileen mentioned in her response, um, in language media sources and just other community-centered in, in, interventions that are important. So thinking of technology is one part of a very holistic solution um, when it comes to 
addressing this kind of a problem. Um, and I know we're running a little short on time, so I'll, I'll thank you, thank you, Jenny, and 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 love your comment. on there's no there's no um, uh, there's no simple fix. It's not a there's no there's no silver bullet here. This is a process, and and and, and it requires all of us to work together. So we're going to do a rapid fire. The last question, um, and would love to sort of quickly go into. We are Apex is in Washington D.C. We do talk to policymakers. This is an important part of the work uh, that Apex is doing. So how can policymakers better support the most positive aspects of technology platforms and tools while limiting the challenges that many of you and all of you have discussed? Both the a positive and negative. How how can how can policymakers help with this? So, Nayana, I'm going to start with you. And again, we're going to go through a rapid fire here. So, if you can keep it short, that would be great. And but we'd like to get all of your ideas in and your comments in. Thanks, Anil. One quick point: I would say consultations with uh, with tech platforms as new policies are drafted for addressing the challenges that we have discussed here is what I would recommend because I believe that. Platforms are experiencing these challenges as well and are probably as invested as anyone else in finding solutions to those challenges, which means that a lot of ground must have been covered in trying to find a solution. A lot of resources have already been invested, which means that um, as policymakers are looking to draft policies and you know find solutions, there is an opportunity for us to co-create some of those solutions instead of you know, everyone operating in silo. So if we can operate from a position of trust, have platforms also at the table at the onset, I believe that could be really helpful for us to be um, way more advanced in how we are addressing these problems. Thank you, Nayana. Uh, Greg. Thanks. Uh, and, you know, for us, uh, you know, one of the themes of this this panel has kind of been how, of course, there is just all of this good that comes with technology, but unfortunately, it also comes along with a host of challenges. And how do we preserve the good while addressing the bad? And, you know, um, the, the, the creative industries are, are, are operating under that dynamic as well. And, and you know, while, of course, digital technologies have created all of these opportunities for for new voices and new mediums and things. It also comes with the challenge of, of, of online piracy for us, which is, uh, you, you know, just, a, I think Jenny called, um, uh, uh, called this an accelerant, right? You know, how it takes problems that have always existed and, you know, you layer on digital technologies and, and it kind of explodes. And that's, that's pretty much been our experience. And just to kind of give you a, a quick sense of the problem, you know, there were 137.2 billion visits to piracy sites, you know, in 2020. And, um, you know, uh, an, an economic report by, by New York Economics and the Chamber of Commerce reported that that cost the U.S. economy about 230,000 jobs and a little over uh, 29 billion annually. And then, of course, in, in a high-risk um, industry like film and television, where there are a lot more flops than hits, you know, that kind of downward pressure on the economics can really can really be a chilling effect. And so, you know, how have we tried to address that? Well, we've, you know, we've spent the last decade uh, building a network of, of voluntary initiatives with um, um, a wide range of of good faith stakeholders in the online uh, ecosystem. And essentially the idea is, is that there are, you know, all sorts of service providers that are exploited by, by um, illegal piracy sites to monetize the stolen content or, um, you, you know, reach audiences. And so how can we um, identify and partner with, with, you know, companies whose services are being exploited by those bad actors? And, you know, and we've had a, a good bit of success with, you know, um, voluntary initiatives with advertising networks, internet service providers, payment processors, user-generated content platforms, domain name registries and registrars, and search engines. Again, kind of marching through um, the tech stack and, and, and how uh, uh, these services, again, are exploited. Um, so, you know, in the in the spirit of rapid fire, you know, anything that policymakers can do to help encourage that sort of private sector collaboration and bring these stakeholders to the table to solve some of these uh, uh, some of these problems again in a way that helps preserve the flexibility of technology to provide these good um, benefits that we all um, uh, benefit from, while at the same time recognizing that we've got a lot of work to do um, um, to ensure that they're not exploited. Thank you, Greg. Eileen. 
Yeah, I'm going to mention six quick things that uh, uh, legislators and exec can do. First, you need to reform but not eliminate the current law called Section 230 that uh, provides complete protection from any liability for the whole tech ecosystem of user-generated content. Reform, don't eliminate. Second, both Congress and some of the states can do this, have to pass legislation that demands more transparency from tech platforms about their content moderation and identity-based hate and gives access to uh, third-party experts so that they can audit it and verify. Third, pass good privacy legislation. There are aspects of that against the surveillance uh, state and the the sort of data collection that directly would directly impact and help fighting online hate. Fourth, support digital education and research. Fifth, get an executive agency like the FTC, a bureau that's specific to looking at some aspects of the disinformation and misinformation that's prevalent. And and sixth and final, make sure that there's that tech expertise and technologists focused on this with civil rights and community impact and a whole of government approach across all agencies. Well, thank you all for this incredible time and and, and insight. And I think uh, many important pieces to take away from here. One, um, there are uh, the negatives that platforms and technologies can have. There are also many positives. um, And how do we promote the best of of people and and how the technologies can help all of us. But also keep in mind that these are are important questions that society as as a whole is facing. um, And there's no silver bullet solutions around here. So we're going to have to require the public, the private, the nonprofit sectors to come together to find the best solutions uh, moving forward. Um, and, and that's going to require some tough conversations. Um, so it's not it's not so, it's not quite as simple as just bring everybody in a room and we're going to come up with the answers. It, it affects um, a lot of people, um, their bottom lines. It affects people's jobs. It's important that we keep that in mind. So, again, thank you to Apex. Thank you, Madeline, for the incredible work that you all are doing. And um, Uh, Thank you to all of you for all the work that you're doing in your organizations. Um, And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our Apex team.